Hi. Good morning. Um, nice to see all of you again. Um, uh, yeah, I was going to talk a bit about um, uh, the drones and why I'm interested in them and some of my work and some of where I think this conversation should possibly go. Um, this is good because I just, I just saw this. Uh, you might have seen this picture before. In fact, you might have seen it in the background of um, uh, one of those clips John Oliver just showed. There, the one with the, the swooping drone uh, bombing the um, bar graphs. Uh, this image was in the background. It's a picture of a, of a drone. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, you might have seen it because it's there and it's in, in lots of other places. And that's because this image is the um, first, or at least first image result for when you Google drone. It's the first picture that you get. Um, and uh, actually, though I say that, I actually Googled it again yesterday because I've been checking periodically. And um, it's now, the s oh, at least in my kind of results set, because your mileage may vary, um, the, um, the first result is now a quadricopter, and this is the second result. And that feels like one of those kind of weird, algorithmic, incredibly important cultural moments when our perception of this object shifts as reflected back to us by the algorithm. But um, for the last, God knows, well, I do know actually exactly how long, but um, the last few years, uh, this image has been the number one Google image result, which means it has endlessly proliferated. As, um, as, as, um, as awareness and discussion of drones has grown, uh, this image has been endlessly Googled by lazy news editors um, and, uh, and stuck up everywhere. Uh, and, I, and I literally have seen it everywhere. We just saw it in that clip. But like, for example, here it is on the front page of a British uh, legal weapons charity um, who I really, really massively admire. Um, but um, there it is there. Here it is on the front page of um, uh, Pakistan's largest English language newspaper website. Um, so so I, you know, I've been collecting many examples of it. They're very easy to find. Um, but there's something quite crucial about this, which is that um, this image isn't a photograph. Uh, this image is a, a render. It's a CGI representation. Um, uh, it took me a while to kind of track it down, but um, I eventually found it posted to uh, like a 3D uh, modeler's hobby website a few years ago. Um, a guy who was literally practicing using CAD had uh, decided to make a, make a Reaper drone and had um, done a fairly accurate job. Um, there's some tells. Um, you can see that um, that's not a real tail number. That's not how the US names their things. The fonts are not quite at the right angle, that kind of stuff. It's obvious when you pay attention, uh, but apparently uh, not obvious enough. Those are, according to him from his posting on this site, uh, actual mountains in Afghanistan. Um, everyone really likes that it's firing a missile because there don't seem to be any other pictures of that, that close up of it. Um, but this, this, this is the central point, is that our most widely circulated, most visible, most shared and seen image of the drone is itself a complete illusion something completely constructed out of software is, in, is entirely unreal in every possible way. Uh, and that, for me, kind of stands for the drone everywhere uh, in, in its most possible ways. Um, I was sort of fascinated for them, with them for a while um, and spent a long, you know, but I sort of heard about them. This was kind of before, five, six years ago, whatever, before they were kind of really hitting the news in a big way, before they went full celeb. Um, but, but they were there and, and, and I was, and, and they were compelling, you know. Um, who doesn't love flying death robots? Um, they have a, a magnetic quality to them, a kind of dark glamour. And I was really, um, I was just amazed that these things exist in the world. I thought this is an extraordinary thing. We, we have fully, <laughs> fully autonomous flying weapon systems. Uh, this is proper science fiction. And I was, I was thinking about them for a long time, trying to, trying to make sure I wasn't just interested in them for that making sure that this wasn't just a kind of adolescent fascination with, with the glamour al alone, because that's not really good enough. Um, so I was trying to think what, it, what, it, what else is about it that makes this object so sort of fascinating. And I was constantly kind of just like approaching it from various directions in order to come to some kind of understanding of it, whether that was just kind of reading it or researching it or whether it was kind of making little models, because I came quite obsessed with um, like wanting to stand in front of one of them, like literally, like 
I, I, I'm finding it difficult to kind of assemble this thing in my head properly. So it would be great just to kind of stand in an airfield or in a hangar, like a room this big, and imagine what it would be if it was just kind of like just sitting there, cold steel, like, and you could go and you could touch it. And you know, wh what would what would that be like to have a kind of one-to-one -one bodily relationship with it? And like this, this doesn't work for that. Like this is this tiny little plasticky thing, and it it gives you no sense of what that like human physical relationship would be. And, and the, like the first thing that's missing from it is like a genuine concept of scale. Um, some people are really good at like estimating distance and size. I think I'm okay, but not very good. And, and I was chatting to my friend here with playing with this model and we were like, we still don't really know how big this thing is. So let's sketch it and let's sketch it one to one. And so we went out into the car park of my studio in London with like a, a schematic printed off Wikipedia and, a, and some chalk and we we drew this thing out to one-to-one -to -one size. Um, and immediately, um, kind of two things happened, really. The first one is that I got a little bit of that kind of physical relationship to it. Immediately, it was something that I felt I could measure myself against in more of a meaningful way. It became something I could relate to, that I could kind of turn over in my head in a, in a um, more effective way. Um, and that's, that's an approach I've taken in many ways in many kind of projects over time, whether it's just like printing out bits of the internet or kind of visualizing physical volumes of data. Like, we have stupid brains, and sometimes it's necessary just to kind of like make something chunky that you can touch in order to, in order to, to, to like think about it meaningfully. But the other thing I realized was that the drone's very invisibility is, is, is part of its nature, that it's... Um, that this is, this is how and, and, and why it exists in order to become invisible, and to become invisible in a number of ways, um, to become both physically invisible, um, to, um, uh, so that it strikes from a distance, so that it can attack without warning, but also to be physically, and, and uh, sorry, uh, to also to be politically and morally invisible, uh, that it, it does what all technologies do, and particularly networked technologies do, which is to become invisible, and so that they are unquestioned, uh, so that they are, um, are kind of unapproachable in, in many ways. Um, like, this is, usually we like this, right? Um, we like to be able to make phone calls by like tapping on a slab of glass and you're talking to someone and you don't have to think too deeply about the processes that are actually involved in that interaction. Um, when that starts to happen around uh, military weaponry and particularly when actually political ideology gets embedded in systems like that and we still treat it as though it's a slab of glass in which we tap, then I think we get into bigger problems. So that invisibility is, is good and it's a nice way to share that invisibility by continuing to draw these drone shadows in different places and drawing them in different places evokes different responses, which is great. Uh, the first one I did kind of publicly was in Istanbul in 2011, I think. Um, and that brings a context of, uh, you know, before then I didn't know. I didn't know that Turkey was designing its own drones. I didn't know that they were hiring, um, kind of leasing US drones to provide surveillance for the conflict with PKK rebels that was then and is still going on in, in the south of the country. That, that wherever the drone goes, it kind of enters its own local context in, a, in an interesting way. Um, I got to draw one in DC. Uh, which is kind of bonkers. Uh, that's right next door to the White House, um, which raises a whole bunch of other questions about the, the, the potential or possibilities of protests that are probably outside this thing, or, or the limits to which art can address them. But there we go, maybe one for the discussion. Um, I, I created this, um, which is the, uh, a handbook to how to draw these things. So it includes instructions for um, like several different models of drone, the outlines, this is how they're bigger, the schematics that I've drawn, so that anyone can go and download this thing from the internet and draw it themselves, um, which they've subsequently done. This is one in uh, Linz in Austria. Um, this is several, a little pack of them. That's in Sao Paulo. I just love this picture, it's awesome. Uh, again, context that I couldn't actually bring the drone to, those are, um, oh, I've forgotten. In, in the UK, we call them Thales watch keepers, um, but they're Elbit, um, Oh, is it the Hermes drone? Uh, an Israeli drone that the Brazilian Air Force has bought and, and flies regularly over Brazil, including over lots of the World Cup games. Um, so again, the, the local context that is brought out by which particular 
when you choose to draw. And of course, here in uh, Gijon, where they've drawn one down um, on the seafront. Um, curiously, the only place I've had trouble doing this was, uh, was Australia, uh, where I went to draw one in, in Brisbane last year. Uh, this, is, this is actually a, a picture from a series uh, that is also represented in the show here, um, which is called Watching the Watchers, which is where I go and find um, images of uh, drones within Google Maps and other kind of publicly accessible maps. Basically, these using the network which renders itself invisible to render visible these invisible objects. It's just invisibility all the way down. Um, but uh, the, this, this is an Australian one. This is a, uh, that little thing there is a drone at the Woomera test site in Australia. Uh, so I went to Brisbane to draw this drone and um, it got censored for a bunch of kind of like incredibly boring bureaucratic stupid reasons uh, by reactionary idiots. Um, but the interesting thing again was the context in which this happens. Uh, I'd been thinking about drones largely as um, you know, weapons of war, essentially. That was, that was the context in which most of the ones that I'd drawn uh, had, been, um, had been kind of used or were seen by local people. The main Australian current relationship with drones is actually about immigration. Uh, the fact that Australia's current immigration policy is designed around preventing people in boats reaching its shores, turning them back before they, they, they get into Australian waters and interning them in pretty unpleasant camps in Nara and Papua New Guinea. Um, and they want drones to do this, um, the, to, to patrol the ocean. So you get, um, you actually, as the drone, the, the drone approach can kind of happily spread its wings over, over far more than just the kind of battlefields. They become integrated into all kinds of uh, kind of surveillance and repression systems. And so the other, the other main drone project that's worth mentioning is, um, uh, is this one. Um, this is a report from the um, Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Uh, there's a couple of organizations that do this. The Bureau is one in the UK, the Long War Journal in the US. And what they do is they, um, they catalog, uh, they investigate, catalog, index um, covert drone strikes. So drones are an incredibly increasingly wide use by militaries all over the world, both internally and externally. Uh, they're, they're in constant use on battlefields, in, if, if we can even refer to such things anymore, in um, kind of Afghanistan or Iraq, places where we know there are wars going on. But there's also a parallel covert drone war um, by the US in, in Pakistan and the Yemen and in Somalia and possibly other places that we, we haven't confirmed yet, um, uh, that is not reported, essentially, that is not acknowledged. So it's, it's starting to be very, very slowly in the last kind of six months or so, but it wasn't for very long. And let's be clear, this is a program of extra legal assassination. And even qualifying as extra legal is, is kind of wobbly. It's just assassination um, uh, without evidence, without uh, any declaration of war, without anything like that. Uh, and so this isn't reported. So places like the Bureau collect these, um, these reports. They look at local media, eyewitness reports, anything they can find to try and draw together um, news about these strikes. Uh, and I was reading them and I want to talk about them because it's important to talk not just about the drone but about what it does in the world uh, and what its effects are. And this is a fairly obvious effect of it, uh, that it permits these, these kind of covert wars and it, and it, and it kills people. Um, but how to talk about these things? And what struck me most was the kind of total absence of any imagery of this stuff, again. Like, how do we, how do we address it when we can't see it in any way? Um, and, um, and that's, it's still weird, right? It's still weird that you can have a covert, complete covert war going on, a complete war going on. And like, this is the only track of it. We've lived in a mass media age for well over 100 years. Uh, before we had, you know, TV or even photography, uh, newspapers would send like illustrators to battlefields. You, know, you could see pencil drawings of these things. I had no idea where these places were and I didn't seem to be able to find any pictures of them. Except of course I could find pictures out of them. Because I could take a phone out of your pocket and you can see through satellites. It's like having a superpower. One day one guy, some guy in the Yemen, posted driving directions to a drone strike uh, on his Twitter feed when he was talking about it. He was like, if journalists would like to get here, this is how you get here. Right. Could you please just drive for 20 minutes and come and see this shit? Um, I don't know if anyone did, but I realized you, know, you could also do it like I was doing it from vast distance. And that's where Dronestagram comes up, which is an ongoing social media record of the landscapes of the covert drone war. Um, 
every time there's one of these drone strikes reported, I go and find one of these landscapes. Roughly, you know, um, Google Maps does not have uh, particularly good coverage of kind of um, some of the more distant prom provinces of Yemen or the, or the Fatah, but, you know, there's, there's places there, and you can, you can go and look at them, and you can see they're composed of houses, that, that people live there, that there are schools and hospitals here. This is not what we think of as a battlefield. There's all kind of problems with this, of course. You know, I'm still at a massive distance. I'm not pretending I'm somehow conveying something magically, you know, brilliant. This is not photojournalism. I'm not on the ground. But, but these, these things, these, this war and the networks we use every day share too many similarities to be ignored. The drone permits sight and action at a distance, just like the network does. It does it kind of invisibly and opaquely, just like the network does. Um, and, and the drone war and the, the, the networked object of the drone is essentially a piece of the same network tuned to surveillance and violence, just as social media systems are pieces of the network tuned to openness and visibility. So what I'm doing, I think, is kind of closing a loop here, just pointing out that the substrate of these things is exactly the same. Um, you get great comments uh, on, on, on Dronestagram. They're mostly quite shouty. There was a lovely one the other day, though, and it made me so happy, uh, because someone went, die, die, American scum, I hate you all, I, I quote uh, vaguely. And someone wrote back saying, hey, don't hate us all, it's our mean government, uh, we don't all agree. And the guy wrote back, like some guy in, 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 in um, the Middle East somewhere wrote back and said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that to all Americans, I agree, it's the governments and corporations fault. And I thought, that's progress, got it right there. Um, most of it's though at shouting. Um, which is fine. Um, but uh, there, there's, there's one kind of weird little critique, I think, buried in there that's quite interesting. Um, the first thing that everybody, say, see, that everybody says when they see a drone shadow is, I had no idea it was so big. And that's, um, that's a good comment, because as soon as you ask that comment, you ask a number of other questions, like, why didn't I know it was so big? Like, that's a... That's a, a natural kind of follow-up question, and then you ask more questions. The question you get, or the, the comment you get most on Dronestagram, if, if you've never used Instagram, it's a image-sharing network. You take a photo, you upload it, people can comment on it, and uh, you know, press the heart button. And the number one comment is, um, I don't want to press like, but, right? The, the, <laughs> I want to show my appreciation for this information, but the only interaction that the system permits is to like it, um, which is a really simple basic comment made about lots of social media systems, but kind of revealed incredibly powerfully here that there is a structural bias to these systems as well. It's built into them and it's a way of illustrating them. It was kind of terrifying watching um, Dronestagram, which, which got a lot of media coverage when, it first, when I first kind of started talking about it. It was really terrifying watching that kind of cascade across across different platforms and different audiences, well, to different speakers to different audiences, none of whom could describe it in any meaningful way. So whether you're like even quite a savvy tech blog, whether you're the Guardian newspaper, whether you're a TV channel, none of them could even really describe accurately what an Instagram account was to their audiences. And it's easy as, as you know, someone with particularly a, you know, a technological background, but even with just a kind of technological nous to to be snarky about that and go like, oh, stupid journalists, they can't even like talk about technology. It's kind of terrifying because how the hell are they going to have a, you know, how the hell are we going to have a public, you know, informed uh, discussion about, uh, you know, the drone war and the, the nuances of that when we can't even discuss social media kind of properly. Um, this is a, a Danish television uh, news broadcast about the war in Syria. Um, the landscape behind the newsreader is um, Damascus as rendered in the video game Assassin's Creed. Um, we're back in the land of the first, uh, first Google image search result. Uh, or this one from the BBC about um, the Amnesty International and the United Nations um, uh, Security Council, again about the Syrian conflict. Though, of course, that's not the United Nations Security Council logo, that's United Nations Space Command from Halo. Um, the fact that um, these, are, these are stupid um, examples and intended to be slightly humorous, but, um, but once you start noticing them as images, you start to noticing them in everything that's said as well. Um, I'm going to drop in a few just other kind of examples of, of things that 
the drone program raises that, again, aren't about the thing itself. Um, I collect weird images of drones, and this is one of my favorites. I'm just going to read you the kind of um, AP news, Newswire description of this image. Edwards Air Force Base, California. After supporting the global war on terror for three years, Global Hawk Unmanned Aerial Vehicle Number 3, UAV-3, received its official homecoming today when its wheels touched down at 11.30 a.m. Pacific time at Edwards Air Force Base. This is a robot receiving a homecoming parade. Um, this, is what, this is how air, air, uh, airfields celebrate the return of, of fighters from war. Um, this is... This is, this is this is automation, essentially, and our, our difficulty with establishing new norms and behaviors around the fact that most of um, the things that used to be done by people are increasingly done by machines. Uh, it runs against one of those kind of things that's hilarious, but also kind of like a, a moment in which we can go, like, there is, uh, <laughs> there's, we, we are having, we are struggling with this, but, but we also need to come up with new approaches to this. As, as, um, as evidenced by this one in particular. Um, this was the Distinguished Warfare Medal, which was proposed uh, by the Department of Defense a couple of years ago now. And the Distinguished Warfare Medal was for distinguished service in the fields of cyber and uh, UAV warfare. Um, it's one of the things I actually quite like, is that the US military acknowledged that cyber was a domain like 10 years ago. While well, everyone else was kind of running around going, oh, the internet's not real, people on Facebook aren't your real friends, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the US Department of Defense was like, yeah, it's real, and it's a territory, and it's, it's, it's analogous in many ways to a physical space, and we need to defend it. They're, they're, they're quite forward-thinking futurists over there. Um, and so after a while of that and a while of UAV flying, they were like, we should be giving these guys a medal if they've been good. The problem was that um, there's a table of medals. And, and this medal would sort of go into the ranking in the US medal system above the Purple Heart, um, which is the medal you get if you are physically wounded on the battlefield. And a lot of people totally freaked out about this, veterans groups and all kinds of other things. And um, you know, they withdrew this medal. Uh, they said, okay, well, we'll chill. Well, we, we were not, we're not gonna do this. Um, and they've replaced it with sort of other honors and various stuff. Um, but the problem is uh, that people are getting wounded even on the US side. By drone stuff. They're, 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 they're discovering this kind of wave of post-traumatic stress disorders in drone pilots themselves, uh, which appear to be occurring at the same, if not higher rates than uh, in, in combat pilots. Um, and there's, you know, there'll be a lot of work on understanding fully why this is, though if you read interviews with drone pilots about their experiences, you understand that it's an extraordinarily stressful thing to do. And again, to me, this reflects back this um, this issue we have with um, fully understanding the emotional weight of technologi technologically augmented experiences. That, that simple thing I said a moment ago about you know, friends on Facebook not being real friends, it's bullshit, and most of us can renounce it from our own experience. Uh, we know we can have incredibly deep and meaningful uh, experiences and relationships entirely through the mediation of computer networks. Um, but our, but our, kind of our hind brains and our moral philosophy and everything else hasn't really caught up with that as a concept yet. We're still struggling with it deeply. Um, but we can see it, right? We can, we can see it and we can talk about it through, through the meaning of the technology itself and understanding the layers at which it operates and the various forms of privilege it involves. Um, this is there's an extraordinary film uh, uh, by an artist called Omar Fast, which I imagine most people in the room have probably seen, uh, called 5,000 Feet is the Best. Uh, which, among various other kind of amazing things he does in that film, is um, he, he interviews um, a drone pilot or drone pilots, and they recount in their own words some kind of the experiences of being a drone pilot. And there's this amazing moment, or amazing to me, when a drone pilot describes uh, targeting, um, targeting something on the ground. And I'll read you the quote from that. Uh, he's talking about when when, as a drone pilot, he spotted something on the ground and he wants, like, someone burying an IED or something, and he wants to, like, either target it directly or call other troops in to do something about it. And he says, he says, we call it in and we're given all the clearances that are necessary, all the approvals and everything else, and then we do something called the light of God. The Marines like to call it the light of God. It's a laser targeting marker. 
We just send out a beam of laser, and when the troops put on their night vision goggles, they just see this light that looks like it's coming down from heaven, right on the spot, coming out of nowhere from the sky. It's quite beautiful. Um, this, is, this is a Photoshop that I made. This is my version of the, of the render drone. Um, this is an image that I made because I couldn't find a good enough image of the, this light of God moment. But to me, there's something quite, quite extraordinary in that vision of, of, um, a, a, of a frequency of light itself that is only visible to those who have the political and technological privilege to see it. It's there, it's there in the world, right? Like, it's moving photons, uh, frequencies, not even photons, frequencies. Whoa, I'm getting into little wave particle dynamics I don't understand. Uh, <laughs> like, actual thing that is there, but only, only if you wear these special magic goggles that cost an absolute bloody fortune and are only available to US Marines, right? Um, and, and, and again, it's that thing, you think, wow, that's kind of insane. That only happens, like, in the... You have to go into like these deep military technologies to be thinking about that, and it only exists in these kind of incredible specialized cases, and it, it turns, turns out that, that's bollocks. Because again, this is a, a silly example, but it's one I like to make. Uh, there's a building in London called the Shard. Uh, it's the tallest building in London. It's completely awful. Um, but they opened it uh, a few years ago. And on the night they were opening it, um, they, they said there was gonna be this huge laser light show, and it was gonna be amazing. Um, and, uh, and you should watch it on Facebook, uh, because obviously. Uh, but nevertheless, like a couple of thousand people turned up uh, on the bridges over the River Thames, right in the center of London, to watch the opening of this huge new building and, to, uh, and this amazing laser light show that was gonna happen. And nothing happened. I, I was there, I stood on the bridge right underneath it. Nothing happened. Um, there were a couple of like, like literally people kind of, it felt like someone was waving a torch off it or something. Like, you could see something was supposed to be happening. Nothing was happening. Nothing happened. The crowd got bored, they laughed a bit, and then we sort of went home. The next day, the newspapers, websites everywhere, and you can look these up, were all full of images that looked like this, right? Every single news site carried, carried, carried these amazing images as the incredible light show that had dazzled Londoners. Bullshit, right? But, but this, this is a photograph. It's just... It's just a way of seeing the same thing if you're seeing it through a long exposure of an incredibly expensive photojournalist camera, right? There was a laser light show there. It, happened, it only happened in a frequency visible to machines. And a frequency that's visible to power, right? This is power speaking directly to power through a, a technological system that's only visible at that level and is kind of rendered down to us when it needs to be kind of spoken to us by, by the media. Um, that's one of the effects that you see happen kind of repeatedly uh, in, in the drone process, the kind of embedding of technological process in a, just within those little networks that only kind of comes out when we need to be uh, kind of shafted with the pointy end. I want to talk about one final, final, final effect of the drone, um, which is the way it takes that, takes all of these effects, it uses them for its own ends in order to commit violence in order to kind of um, ignore all kind of geopolitical boundaries and, and, and do anything it wants to, but also how it then, it then transfers that privilege to like other contexts, the way it kind of moves its own moral and ethical framework into other places. Um, I had a really long fight with the Metropolitan Police, London's police over the last couple of years, trying to get them to admit whether or not they use drones, because uh, they said they were going to for the Olympics. Um, I know they didn't because I also asked a bunch of other people if they had permission and so on and so forth, and they didn't. But the police themselves, despite a huge number of kind of legal requests, would not, neither confirm nor deny the use of drones. Um, which is weird, because they talk about cars, and they talk about helicopters, and they talk about all the other resources at their disposal on which they spent public money, on which they spent the kind of taxpayers' money. Um, but uh, drones are magic, right? Uh, as soon as it comes to drones, we, we don't have to talk about them in the same way. Because, because they freight with them these kind of strange contexts. It was the same when, um, uh, with those missing schoolgirls, who I believe are still missing in Nigeria, uh, when the US said it was going to send, um, uh, send uh, surveillance assets to Nigeria to assist in the search. And, it, and like Brigadier General Myers went on you know, CNN and said, uh, yes, we're sending a PA to Ryan plane to, to Nigeria to assist in the search. And then 
they cut back to the anchor who goes, unnamed spokespeople have also confirmed the use of unmanned aerial vehicles in this search. And it's like, they're magic, right? They, they've, they've weaponized not just the network itself and kind of, you know, the, this ability to kind of pair surveillance and violence in all these ways, but they've kind of weaponized military thinking and strategy itself and can then take that and kind of through into other places. Um, I got many more examples of that kind of thing, but I, I just want to say kind of this stuff in, 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 um, in, in final language, which is the kind of bigger point again, to, get to kind of move away from the horrible bloody objects um, that they are, um, which is to say what I've been sort of saying all along, which is that we're really, really, really bad at metaphors. Um, like we're really bad at, at describing uh, like the actual state of the world that we find ourselves in today, the cloud being a really prime example of that, uh, being a terrible, terrible metaphor for the world around us, and, and frankly, an incredibly harmful one. Um, uh, because, you know, it's not a magic faraway place. It's like a massive shed, many, many massive sheds full of computers uh, where all of your secrets are kept that are, um, you know, vast energy-consuming networks that require fossil fuels and other resources to run that reside within national jurisdictions that fall within various kind of legal frameworks, all of this kind of stuff. Um, these metaphors, like, that we have at the moment for the network world are, are simply not good enough. Um, and it leads to kind of incredibly um, damaging uh, processes of which I think the, 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 what, what has been allowed to happen with drones for the last 10 years is an incredibly strong part. I think the drone war is in large part a kind of product of this technological opacity that we've gone along with for so long. Because um, like technological opacity is built in at every single level of the system. Even, even those little black boxes, which I called a superpower earlier, are still deeply opaque to us. They remain kind of uh, incredibly vastly unknowable. Um, and we live kind of within that system. It extends not just from the phones uh, to the drones, uh, to all the way up into kind of 22,000 uh, kilometers up to the, the GPS network, for example, to take one. Every time you, you know, use Google Maps to go somewhere, every time I use it for drone Instagram, I'm communicating with this vast network of things that we live inside. And yet this remains the mental image of the, of the networked world that we hold inside our heads for kind of want of a better image. Um, I always refer to this as the network, as kind of not just uh, the internet, but the internet and us, like as a complete and composed system. And the thing is, I've been talking all this time about the hideous opacity of the network, its quality of invisibility, its kind of quality of effectively, effectively secrecy and the, the kind of abuses of politics that flow from that. Um, but I also believe that the network is the, na is the naked lunch, effectively, um, in, in kind of Burroughs' phrase, of, at the moment when everybody sees what is on the end of every fork. Um, uh, the network doesn't produce weird new behaviors. People go, oh, people are like this on Facebook because they've suddenly got Facebook and they do all this kind of stuff, or, or we do this because we have drones. It's like, no, 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 no. This permits uh, existing behaviors to come to their fullest and often most terrifying effect. Uh, it reveals uh, structures of power um, that are mostly ancient, <laughs> that, that are biases and things that have existed in society for quite a lot longer. Um, because of a low level of technological literacy, those, those structures are, like technology has been formed in the image of those structures and has been reproducing them, but that doesn't have to be the way that it is. The ability to see those structures, structures of political violence, structures of oppression, are also part of the kind of gift of the network. But it's not a, um, it's not, it's not a free gift, right? It requires work. It requires a, a, an effort of raising our own technological literacy, uh, which then um, slowly, painfully transforms essentially into a form of, of political agency when we are actually fully capable of rendering the world accurately and, and describing it properly. Um, but, but for me, like, um, it, remains, it remains largely hopeful in this because, uh, because I think that's what it's for. Right? I think that's what we've built the internet and these other networks for is in order to be able to use them to describe this apparently terrifying complexity of, of drones and everything else better. Thank you very much.